Well, as you know, we're doing a series on the Gospel of Luke and looking at a bunch of parables. And I just want to tell you as we get started that the Gospel of Luke is the happiest book in the world. And just to explain and to give you a little background on the Gospel of Luke, I want to start with a, with a story. A couple weeks ago, our daughter Anna was home for a couple days for her fall break from college. And so uh, Caroline and, and Rachel were in school, so we decided to take Anna up to San Francisco and have a little fun. So we went to the Ferry Building. How many of you have been to the Ferry Building? Really fun place. Got some coffee, some pastries, went out by the ferry terminal, sat on a bench, and looked east towards the East Bay and the, the Bay Bridge and so on. It was a beautiful day. And the, uh, it, we didn't realize at the time, but it was the first day of Fleet Week. So there are these planes doing tricks over our heads and these enormous Navy ships cruising in. Really just, just perfection. So we decided that we're going to walk from the ferry building down to the Pier 39 area. And we get down to close to, I guess it's Pier 45, and we see something that we've never noticed before, which is the uh, Musée Mécanique the Mechanical Museum. I don't know if any of you who've been there have seen this. I never noticed it before, but we poke our heads in, and it's this arcade with 300 of these coin-operated arcade games. I mean, nothing new like Chuck E. Cheese where you get your card and you swipe it and it spills out tickets. No, this is old school with all these old games, like these slot machines and pianos and these diorama things and these uh, you know, figures behind glass that would move if you put the quarter in. Some of them kind of fun, some of them admittedly kind of creepy. And so we're, we just th- think, wow, this is quite a place. And, and, um, and then Anna, who is a real musical, uh, some of you know, she notices this giant organ the giant or the mighty Wurlitzer. And she looks at this thing, and the top has these pipes on it. It's got this kind of glockenspiel with drums and cymbals, and it's decorated, as you can tell, with people playing lyres, and it's got some uh, roses on there. And, and she says, I have got to hear the mighty Wurlitzer. And the thing, and, the, and there's a little sign that says uh, right there, in fact, it's out of view in this picture, but it says, play the mighty Wurlitzer along with another little sign that says, the happiest music in the world, with a little arrow pointing to the quarter receptor. <laughs> and so Anna sees it and says, I, I just, I, I got to hear this thing. And of course, she's a college student. She doesn't have any money. So she, she looks at me, and, and I give her a couple of bucks for the, the, um, the, you know, the quarter to, to make change. But secretly, I'm thinking, this is going to be The biggest waste of two bucks for me in a long time. But she takes the quarter, she puts them in the acceptor, and again, there's kind of commotion and noise because of all these mechanical uh, machines and, and all the people walking around. And then all of a sudden, when she pulls this thing out, melody just erupts from the mighty Wurlitzer. And it's unlike any sound we've ever heard. It just, at the speed of sound, it just fills up the whole arcade and it transforms the room. It was just remarkable. And uh, I thought, indeed, that's no lie. That is the happiest music in the world. And we're just shocked because of just the volume. This wasn't like elevator music, just with a little bit of pleasant background. This thing just flooded the room. And so um, Anna and, and, and Becky, um, just because they can't help it, they start to kind of dance just a little bit. And I just start to laugh, thinking this is the best two bucks I've spent in a long time. And then uh, I pull out my phone and start to videotape and start to notice some of the reactions in the room. Because first, like I said, Anna and Becky, you know, they're subtle, but they start to kind of move. And then this guy, with a San Francisco Giants jersey and a black beanie cap, he comes up and he starts to kind of move in this kind of cool guy with a black beanie kind of way. (laughs) Kind of subtle, but he's definitely moving. And then um, we see this young couple. In fact, Anna points him out to me. And they've turned away from their game, and no joke, they start swing dancing. (laughs) 
big smiles on their faces. This guy is just totally twirling this girl around, and I'm just laughing and filming. And then Anna and Becky say, no, don't, you can't film, don't film. So I gotta put my, my phone down. And then finally, the last reaction. And I didn't notice this until I watched the video later on that day. Um, but there's this woman who, who had been sitting nearby, staring at her phone, and as soon as the music starts, she looks up, and she shoots me this icy look. <laughs> like, you're the people who are playing the music. And then she looks down at her phone again. But I thought, you know, this experience of the mighty were lit, sir. This is the perfect picture of the Gospel of Luke, which is the happiest book in the world because the Gospel of Luke tells the story of God's music coming to us. That God's music came to us. It's God's own personal arrival in the person of his son, Jesus, our king, to save us and to fit us out, to help us to prepare for his kingdom. And, and that's what it's all about. It's about God's coming in Jesus, the promised Davidic savior, and starting, honestly, this exuberant symphony of deliverance and salvation. That's what Luke is all about. And when God came in the person of Jesus, we, we can see in Luke this symphony and how the music starts to get into people. And when God's music comes, we see things like deliverance from cacophony and noise and chaos. And we saw, as we read Luke, we see people being raised from the dead. We see uh, people getting delivered from demons, getting uh, unhooked from things that have pinned them down when the music of God and Jesus comes into people's lives. And the thing about the music is that it had been promised in writing. Just like there was a sign next to the Wurlitzer that said, play the mighty Wurlitzer. That this, this coming of God's music had been promised in the Hebrew scriptures. That God himself would come to help us, and he did. He came in the person of his son to save and deliver and to reclaim his creation. And a few weeks ago, uh, we, we shared about God's take back project. God coming to take back that which is his, his creation, his people, uh, which had been seized upon by darkness and evil that we led into the creation. But God himself is coming to take it back because it's his. And that's why we exist as a church. Because we, we want to share, like, like a big corporate Wurlitzer, the good news about the music of God in Jesus the King. And I don't know if you have that music in, inside you. I, I hope you, I know a lot of you here, you do. But if you don't know about this Jesus, and you are weighed down, and you are gripped by sorrow and despair about the state of the world, you need the music. And, and we exist to tell the story about Jesus. And so you got to just keep coming and let us befriend you, and we'll tell you about him and this music. And, and, and you know what? And we think you're going to soar when you come to know this story. Okay, so that's just the Gospel of Luke. Today we have a, a parable from Luke uh, 16, and just by way of some background, the Gospel of Luke is really three big sections. Okay, the first one is uh, chapters one through eight. It's Jesus' announcement of the kingdom. Again, God's take back project. And we see in the first eight chapters the music going out in the cacophony of Galilee with all the revolution and the disorder and the tension. And as Jesus goes around, he heals and he preaches and, and people begin to be transformed and get lifted up. Well, the second section, chapters nine through 19, is what scholars call the journey section or the travel section of the Gospel of Luke, where Jesus goes from Galilee to Jerusalem. And during this 10 section part of the book, he's going to teach, He's going to proclaim the music of God, the kingdom, and some people are going to embrace the music, and some people are going to reject the music, just like today when they hear about Jesus. And then finally, the third section, chapters 20 through 24, it's his time in Jerusalem when he will secure forgiveness of sins for his people and defeat of all evil powers by going to the cross and dying and rising and ascending to the Father's right hand. That's the third part of Luke. Well, today we're in the second 
we're, we're, in the, we're in the second part, the travel narrative. And in this section, Jesus is going to talk to his supporters, people who have embraced the music, and Jesus is going to talk to his opponents, people who have rejected the music, like the Pharisees. And he's going to talk, he's going to give in this, in this section three parables that relate to our stuff, our money and our possessions. Uh, and, and so we're going to look at Luke 16. In fact, this is kind of fun here. Becky and I were in Capitola a couple weeks ago, and I was thinking about Luke 16. I had it kind of going around in my mind, and I've come across this license plate, Luke 16. And I thought, that is a sign from the Lord that we've got to talk about Luke 16. So anyway, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you the main takeaway right up front. This is the one thing that I want you to remember today, and it's this, discipleship equals stewardship. Discipleship equals stewardship. That's the one thing that I want us to remember today because followers of Jesus manage resources. We don't monopolize them because we have been seized with the music of God, right? So we don't monopolize things. No, we have a totally different perspective on money and possessions because discipleship equals stewardship, and we'll see how in this parable today. Okay, so for the parable, from Luke 16, it's the parable of the dishonest manager. Some of you know it. It's a little gem of Jesus' brilliant storytelling because it consists of five scenes, five short scenes, and then Jesus makes an observation, and then Jesus makes an application. So let's see what it is here. Okay, scene one, which is verse one of chapter 16. He, Jesus, also said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. So here we have two main characters here. We have the rich man, and we have his manager. And just like in in modern times, wealthy people often hire uh, people with business acumen to manage their affairs with one objective maximize the rich man's profits. That's, that's the idea here. Well, we hear that this manager has squandered the rich man's resources, and we don't know how. But somehow word gets back to the rich man, and he is not happy. So here we go. Here's scene two, the confrontation. And he, meaning the rich man, called the manager and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. So the rich man calls him in, does a brief interrogation, you know, give an account of your management, uh, and doesn't even wait for an answer. The manager probably doesn't have an answer. His silence is probably an admission of guilt. And the rich man fires him on the spot. And then we can imagine he turns away to get back to business, Number one being, I've got to hire a new manager, right? So here's scene number three. Let's call this the crisis. And the manager said to himself, what shall I do? Since my master is taking the management away from me, I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. So here in in this scene, the manager staggers away from the rich man's office, and and the manager is in crisis, and he's by himself, and everything is melting down around him because he had thought that he had a lifetime position, that he was set for life as manager for this rich man, and now he's thinking, I'm going to be out in the cold. And you can almost hear his despair in the question, you know, what, what shall I do? And of course, he, he immediately dismisses the prospects of digging and begging, which were for people the lowest of the low who've been driven off their, their family parcels. And, and it's easy to think, well, maybe he's just being proud, right? But, but, but not so. I mean, this guy is a bureaucrat. This is all he's done all his life. He's not going to be able to compete with people who have done physical labor all their lives. So this guy is in serious trouble. And then with his, his reputation in tatters, he's not going to get the kind of work that he did before. So this guy has to think fast to avoid absolute ruin. And his mind is racing. And then I picture this way as he's kind of hitting 
his, uh, his hand against his, his head, he realizes he has something still in his hand. He's still holding the master's account book. And then all of a sudden, he hatches a plan when he sees this book. He hadn't turned it over yet, and his termination is in public, and he has a brainstorm. And here's verse four. Uh, here's what he has to say. Here's the, the, the idea. I have decided what to do so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So he has an idea. And then in the absolute brilliance of Jesus' storytelling, we're gonna see the plan in action. It's gonna be demonstrated, not told to us. So here we go. Scene four, the quick thinking. So, summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, how much do you owe my master? He said, a hundred measures of oil. He said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Then he said to another, and how much do you owe? And he said, a hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and write 80. So just picture it. The manager calls in all the debtors that day. The first debtor has no idea, probably thinking this is going to be really bad, right? But the manager is just all smiles. And, and he, he just says, well, how much do you owe? And the, uh, of course, the manager already does know, right? That's his business to know. And he has the book. But uh, what does he do? To the absolute surprise of the debtor, he slashes the debt in half with the stroke of his pen. And you can imagine just the relief, the joy on the part of this debtor here who asks no questions, right? But he accepts this act of kindness with, with great joy. Well, um, there are only two debtors who are mentioned, but, but the scene really suggests that that day a whole stream of debtors walked through that office. And that manager was just slashing one after the other after the other. And so here's the upshot, is that the manager goes home that day, his last day, with dozens of new friends. People that he can count on for hospitality down the road when he's out of work, which is going to be in about five minutes, right? So here's scene five. This is the shocker, because we don't see this coming. And now we're back, presumably, in the rich man's office for a very different encounter here. Here's the surprise. Verse 8. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. So offstage, somehow he's discovered the cleverness of the manager, and once he realizes what's happened, he's certainly mad. But he can't help but acknowledge what a clever trick this was, and how shrewd his former employee was. So what he's doing here with this commendation is he doesn't praise him for his injustice, but rather for his ingenuity under pressure. He just can't help but think, wow, that was a pretty skillful trick he played. And exactly how the story ends, Jesus doesn't tell us, but we, we can assume he's not going to prosecute this guy because as lawyers say, you know, you can't get blood out of a turnip, right? He doesn't have anything. And besides, if he prosecuted, word would get out about what a trick was played on this rich guy. And he doesn't want the embarrassment. So he's probably just going to laugh it off. He's got plenty of resources, and he's going to let it go. That's how I kind of picture it. Well, uh, in verse 8 and verse 9, Jesus is going to make an observation and an application so here's the observation that Jesus makes after he's finished telling the story. He says this, kind of strange. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. Interesting. Another uh, version has it this way, that the people of this world, your version might say the sons of this world, but it, it's just general, generalized people. The people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation. So what, what's going on here? So Jesus is, is making a contrast. He's, he's making a contrast between two kinds of people, the people of the world and then the people of the light. Well, who are the people of the world? Well, they're, they're like people people like the dishonest manager. And, and in our context, they're, they're people who, who really haven't heard or responded to the music of God 
in, in Jesus. And what Jesus is saying is that people of the world, like we've just seen in this parable, they use worldly wealth in clever ways according to their system, according to the economic system that they have, that the people of the world are pretty good at uh, being clever with their, with their money. Just like this manager, he had seen an opportunity, right? He thought fast, and, and he benefited himself with an economic choice, so to speak. He, he was savvy. He used wealth to secure a future advantage. That's what Jesus is saying. Now, in contrast, people of the light, who are people who have been, or you could maybe even say um, people of the sound, right? People have been embraced by the music of God and Jesus. Uh, the, the, they're the disciples who listened to him that day. They're the people in this room largely, disciples of Jesus. He's saying that we're not as skillful often in uh, living within our system, the system of kingdom of God economics. We're not as shrewd as people of the world. And, and a lot of times believers don't know how to live in keeping with the kingdom that is already present. And, and what that means for us economically. And so Jesus is, is saying that we need to understand our system. We need to understand the system of kingdom economics, and we should be shrewd. Well, that raises the question, how do material resources work within the economic system of the kingdom of God? What is our system here? And is there such a system? And, and there is. And the key principle of kingdom economics is this, and this is really the, the title, is that disciples own nothing now, but will own everything in the everlasting. That's the first principle. We don't own anything now. Or, or put another way, ownership in this present age is an illusion. You know, and even this is true for people, of all people, whether they're of the light or, or not, um, that people don't own anything in the present age. They really don't. Everything people have, money and possessions, is, is in trust. It, it's loaned to us. Uh, because none of us can keep our present resources forever, right? That's true. And I love this Sherlock Holmes quote I put at the top of your notes. The world is full of obvious things which nobody by any chance ever observes. And isn't that true with our, our money? The obvious thing is that all of us will be separated from our stuff. That's just, that's just a fact, but it's really easy to have tunnel vision and to, to ignore that. That everyone in this present age will part with material resources through financial reverses, or through death, or the, the coming of King Jesus. So everything we, we have now, have in quotes, have control over, is on loan. And, and this is the, the teaching, too, of one of the other parables about money and things in, in Luke 12 about the rich fool, the guy who made just a ton of money through his land, but decided rather than sharing and giving, he decided to build bigger barns. And he was under, again, the illusion of ownership. And you can just see how many times he uses the possessive pronoun my, my crops, my grain, my goods. But it was all a fiction. It was all a fiction. In fact, all these things are just grants for temporary use. And as, as one author put it this way, my with money is a myth. His is what it is. It's his. My, it's a myth. We own nothing. He, he owns it all. In fact, here's another point about that parable of the rich fool. Even our lives are loans. Our, our very existence is a loan. In Jesus' parable, the rich man, God says, this very night, your life, your suke, will be demanded of you. And that verb for demanded is used in other contexts in ancient literature for debt repayment. Or for, it's, it's like it's, your life is alone, not just your stuff, the very you. <laughs> um, probably like, like, uh, like me, you like to, to listen to books on tape, maybe when you're driving or you're, you're exercising. And so uh, I get a lot of books from the Cupertino Library and I, I check them out and then I listen to them on the Libby app. 
Maybe you already have the Libby app, cool app. You can listen to things and, and make good use of your time. Well, it always happens this way, that I'm listening to something really interesting or really exciting, and I can't wait to get to the end and find out what happens to the hero or whatever. And I'm so excited. I pop my, ear, my AirPods in, and I'm about to hit play, and then I get the notification that says, your loan has been returned. And I know you've experienced this too. It's, oh, it's so disappointing. And what surprises me the most when I get this notification is that I'm so surprised that I got the notification because it's happened like dozens and dozens of times. It never ceases to surprise. Oh, because we all default to ownership thinking, right? I'm still surprised when the IT librarian says the loan is up, you gotta return the book. And the same is true with our lives because one of these days we're all gonna get a notification that says your life has been returned. And we're all gonna stand before God separated from our stuff that was loaned to us. But, But here's some wisdom, and I know this isn't new, But within our system, disciples of Jesus can use material resources entrusted to us, not just to benefit others, but even, as surprising as it sounds, to benefit ourselves in the world to come. That's part of the economic system of the kingdom. Again, big takeaway, discipleship equals stewardship, not ownership. So what are are some stewardship habits here, and again, I know you know these, but I just grouped them into five. Here are five stewardship habits. They're budgeting. Just deciding early on, I'm going to live according to a frugal budget. I'm going to be good at managing my money according to a predetermined budget. Second, um, uh, I'm going to save. I'm going to save for an emergency, or or maybe like we might discover down the road, I'm going to save for ideological cancellation. As the world gets a little bit more hostile towards Christians, it's good for us. Some of us may lose our, pr- our professions out of loyalty to Jesus. And so it's good to be, to be saving now. Not that we're in jeopardy because our good God will take good care of us. But it's, it's important to budget and it's important to save. Next, avoiding debt or getting out of it because the borrower is the slave to the lender. As Proverbs 22, 7 says. And more about debt in just a second. And then finally, And this is the most important one. It's giving generously to the church and to kingdom of God causes. That I'm going to be a generous giver. I'm not going to build bigger barns. I'm going to invest material resources into the things of God, the local church and missionaries and other needs that I become aware of. I'm going to give. And then finally, contenting rather than envying. Really practicing contentment. You know, I was thinking about something that Kurt said a couple weeks ago when he preached, and he mentioned how the soldiers who repented at the preaching of John the Baptist, they wanted to know how they could repent, show their faith, and bear fruit. So he, they asked John the Baptist, and, and, uh, and John says to them, be content with your wages. Be content with what you have, and what a message that is for us. You know, the the story is told about this billionaire hedge fund manager who gave a party, and at this party were these famous authors, Kurt Vonnegut and Joseph Heller. And, And Vonnegut, one of the authors, he turned to Joseph Heller, and he said that their billionaire host had made more money in a single day than Heller had earned in his entire life from the, his wildly popular book, Catch-22. He just pointed this out to him. And Joseph Heller responded to Kurt Vonnegut, and he said this. He said, yes, but I have something that our host will never have. Enough. I have enough. You know, Paul told Timothy, but godliness with contentment is great gain. You know, speaking of, of, of debt, um, I've got a, a friend over Santa Cruz Bible named Kim Shirley, and, and she was real involved in our stewardship ministry, and she, when I met with her, because I was the pastor kind of overseeing stewardship, but didn't know much about it, and Kim taught me a ton about biblical uh, stewardship, and so when I was putting this message together, I said, I gotta get in, co- in contact with, with Kim, 
and see if I can at least get her testimony. She was happy to share it. So here's what Kim wrote. This was from a testimony she gave at Santa Cruz Bible um, about 15 years ago now. She said, hi, my name is Kim Shirley. Today I have been asked to share some of my testimony regarding debt. The suffering it caused, its negative consequences, and how it influenced my family and our emotional state. My husband Gary and I were living the American dream. We both had high paying jobs. As a result, we began living beyond our means like never before. Whatever we wanted, we got. Our first rental property, three new dirt bikes, a new motorcycle, you name it. New cars, expensive hobbies, trips to Disneyland and Yosemite. We did what we wanted to do when we wanted to do it. Not always as a family, mind you, because Gary worked three jobs and was not at home very often. We justified our lifestyle by believing we worked hard and we deserved it. But none of this stuff brought peace or contentment. We wanted more, so we decided to continue to invest in real estate. After we prayed about it, we dove into even more debt. Years went by, and we continued to believe we were in God's will. Well, in 2008, everything began to change. The real estate market tanked. Our family unit was weak. Our jobs and income changed. Our health suffered. And today, we are in the process of foreclosing on our last investment property. More, most importantly, debt brought us to a place of humility and a desire to get it right and for the first time learn how to do it God's way. Acknowledging we were out of his will was painful and humbling but necessary. So in 2008, I met with Dave Whiting, a uh, friend of ours, and Jim Good, seeking the biblical knowledge that would provide the guidance we needed they both shared tools and wisdom that began this enlightening journey to becoming debt-free and learning to walk in financial peace. Some of the powerful realizations along the way, it all belongs to God. God is showing us how to be better stewards of what he has entrusted to us. We are learning ways we can honor, obey, and glorify God and teach our teenager God's plan to live a life free of debt. You know, speaking of teaching teenagers, Claudia Itahara, I don't know if Claudia is here today, but she came up to me the other day and said, hey, you know, it'd be so cool one of these days to, to make sure that our, our teenagers and others get training in finances, right? I thought, you know, that's really true. That, that's, a, that's something we got to do around here. We got to figure out not just for our, our teenagers on the threshold of adulthood, but, but all of us. I got a long way to go in this area of life as well. So we, we need to do that. Um, anyway, that's Kim's story. She said, um, but just to finish the story, she said, nearly two years later, our debt has been reduced by well over 30000 God met us where we are. Today, we are joyful to be free from debt, and our family unit is stronger as a result. Right? So praise God. Um, okay, let me just go back uh, to one other point before Pastor Steve comes up and, and shares. This is Jesus' application here. Okay, he's made an observation that, hey, the people of the world are shrewder than us people of the light uh, when, when you compare systems here. But then he said this. Here's his big application. He says, verse 9, and I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth so that when it fails, when it fails, they may receive you into eternal dwellings. Wow, that, that's kind of weird, huh? Right? Making friends. What's he talking about here? It really means giving particularly to kingdom causes, the church and the poor with the resources at our disposal. And he calls it unrighteous wealth, not because money is evil in and of itself, just because it so easily leads to evil, right? But for those of us who have embraced the music of God in Jesus and have joy in our hearts, we make friends that he says when we help people, we invest in the kingdom, especially the poor, that will be the welcoming party at the door when we enter the kingdom. Isn't that just an amazing thought? That's a shocking thing. He says that those whom we helped with our stuff, our money and our possessions, will welcome us into eternal dwellings. And again, this is a, a reference to the completed kingdom, the new world full of God's glory when Jesus comes back. And sometimes in the Bible, that world is likened to a tent. Like Psalm 61.4, let me dwell in your tent 
forever. God's new creation, just conceived of as this tent full of God's glory, God's people, wonder, and, and abundance. So here's how one scholar put it. He said, put yourself in a good position through your use of money, which so easily leads you astray, so that when this age is over, God will receive you into eternal dwellings. And you might think, man, that just sounds a little bit weird. It's like we know that, that it's all about faith, and here's this thing about economics and investing, and yeah, it sounds a little weird to us. But, but listen, here's what, here's what Jesus, I think, is saying. Our takeaway is this. Discipleship equals stewardship, but we can also add to it this, that discipleship equals stewardship, and stewardship habits express faith. They do express the faith we have, right? Do we really believe this gospel? Are we really following him? Is that really the faith in our hearts? Well, if so, it is gonna get expressed in the financial choices that we make. Jesus goes on, verse 10, one who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much, and the one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. Um, can we say that we want to take a fresh stab at these five stewardship habits? Can we begin to cultivate contentment? Because money is a test, right? And how are we doing with that test? All of us as disciples. Luke 16, 11. If then you have not been faithful in the, in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? Well, what, are, what are those? Well, that's a sermon for another day. And if you have not been faithful in what is another's, who will give you that which is your own? Interesting, huh? Again, that's a sermon for, for another time. 